Thanks for staying with us. With over 2 million Nigerians displaced and more than 600 killed by floods, starts. more people are at risk of economic ha um, hardship as the situation bites harder in the country. College services have been severely affected due to inaccessible roads, leaving millions of business owners also at risk. This is the plight of Nigerians who depend on the good supply chain in the country for their livelihood. The flooding across Nigeria has left many rural communities waterlogged. Farmers fleeing the natural disaster have given up their properties and farm investments, prioritizing their survival. Combined with the already adverse effects of insecurity and climate change on agricultural outputs, observers say the crisis will push the country faster towards food insecurity. Today, we're discussing the state of the country's food supply chain. Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation, send an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818-038-4663. Tweet at us at Wayshow Africa with the hashtag Wayshow. So food insecurity, ladies, what does that mean to you? in actual reality in the real sense of mm -hmm. i mean it just just well in layman's terms we know that now tomatoes is no longer as cheap as it used to be okay then we ask questions like okay what happened why do you now have four pieces of onions for 500 naira and all of that and then the guys selling to you then tell you oh madam the trailer where they bring them come now Many of them, they come again, or you know, things like that. So I think that's what food insecurity is in layman's terms. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I like uh, your layman's terms. Because <laughs> um, my own is even more, is, is anything like much more lay. <laughs> <laughs> so food security is a joy that I see food that I say I love mm. to eat. Yeah. You're wondering why we started this show with a lot of food vibe. This yeah. is the reason. Because mm -hmm. we've been Absolutely. thinking food because of yeah. the conversation. But I like that we have um, an expert in that area so that he Absolutely. can explain that chain because um most of us just think of what we eat in the immediate but there is a lot yeah. of processes that go to production and everything from the seeding to the mm. manure to yeah. everything it's a lot yeah and we actually um from the little i know from uh, in agriculture and those i've spoken to we are not doing good mm -hmm. um especially even in the supply and logistics chain that's mm. that area infrastructure is a problem so Absolutely. i'm sure that our guests will really have to touch on infrastructure because even when you have um the produce mm -hmm. how you move them how you store that's them so a lot of people yes. don't even have the, the the fund to be able to build the kind of storage they need yeah. to mm -hmm. then um store for a longer period of time mm -hmm. it's more like we are doing hand to mouth when we are yeah, you know, and whatever we can't eat is the spot. There's mm -hmm. a lot of you know, so there, so, yeah. there is a lot that mm. needs to be done, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation with yeah. you, so that I can continue eating food. In so case. exactly, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wastage is a huge problem, right? Because even at the point, like you said, logistics is one side of it, mm -hmm. but even when things are in season, mm. um, the amount of tomatoes that go to waste, the amount Absolutely. of oranges that go to waste. All of these things are not being processed. So if mm -hmm. you take tomatoes, for example, which is probably our most staple fruit, because they say fruits are not a vegetable, mm -hmm. um, you find that a lot of it goes to waste, but we're importing tomato puree, tomato, tomato paste. paste. Hmm. So we just don't have the capacity or we don't have the infrastructure to be able to produce, um, to process these things, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the production and then the processing and the storage, like mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. are all issues. So I'm also looking forward to learning a lot from our guests yeah. today because the most important part of this thing is that it hits our pockets. Yeah, it, it does. You know, it all does. of these things, as much as it seems like we're so far removed from it, mm -hmm. in the reality, it comes down to us to a bunch Spend of more. plantain is now 8,000 yes. naira mm -hmm. when it used to be 2,000 naira yeah. a few years ago. I think I saw a research, I don't know if it's this, it has to be last year, um, that said that most Nigerians spend about 70% or 80% of what they earn on food. Mm. So. That's, no, 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 that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, double digit inflation, let's <laughs> see what our guest is going to educate <laughs> us about. Adebayo Adelike is a renowned supply chain geopolitics and leadership expert. He has profound knowledge and expertise in the fields of emerging markets, risk management and security, supply chain management and logistics, leadership, um, geopolitics, diversity and inclusion. Adebayo is also a seasoned combat veteran of the United States Army with 20 years of service. Thank you so much for joining us, Adebayo. It's great to have you on the show. Pleasure. Uh, you know, at the backstage listening to you all, you guys have really cracked me up. Uh, it's, been a, it's been an awesome experience just listening to you and sharing your experiences. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. 
So in our own layman's terms, we've tried to define mm -hmm. what we understand by food insecurity. So we'd like you to tell us from the context of um, the supply chain of our food today in Nigeria, can you give us a, a quick summary of what that supply chain looks like and how it contributes to um, the larger problem of food insecurity? So we define you know, supply chain movement of goods and services from the point of origin to where they, to their you know, designated uh, consumer. And then you extend it to when the particular material re-enters the heart again, the reverse part of logistics, the reverse supply chain. Uh, when it comes to the essence of the food industry, it's completely different ball game because, uh, because of the sensitivity of it. So you can actually define food security in two terms. Uh, the you know, sec securing the, the, the food supply chain and uh, the value chain, the pipelines to it. Mm -hmm. And also the ability to be able to provide food when it's necessary. Uh, I think that is what resonates with a lot of people more. How can I get my food when I need it without waiting in line? I think that is that is the that is a huge challenge. That is the food security that we talk about. So, uh, defining food supply chain is all supply chain processes from the production from cradle to grave. Let me put it that way: from cradle to grave uh, of every food item on our table, from spices to tuber crop to grains, name it, to milk to fresh food and vegetables. Uh, so all these things over there. So let's look at Nigeria. Uh, am I just, can I go on? I don't want yes, to be please. on the soap opera region. Yes, Nigeria please. is very unique, very unique. Uh, we call it, uh, uh, you know, center of gravity of Africa. So because there's a lot, not because of our ethnical uh, kind of combination, uh, but also because of our population and because of our geopolitical uh, kind of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, combination as well because Nigerian geopolitical landscape is quite unique and quite different. Uh, so many ethnic groups. I think Nigeria has about 500 languages and whatnot. But there's, already, there's a unique part of it too. We produce so much food in different parts of the country. So there is an equal need for all Nigerians, all from different geopolitical zones, to actually work together to make Nigeria to have secured a uh, food pipeline within Nigeria. But what we're experiencing right now uh, on a macroeconomics standpoint, the inflation is one part. But there are other things that actually contain why food insecurity is at large one of Nigeria's number one problem. Uh, we have the current flooding issue, which is uh, climate change. Depending on who you're talking to or who is, you know, whatever their position is on climate change, you they believe it in or not. But flooding is real. Uh, drought is real. Uh, we, I mean, flooding is what, we, what we're seeing today. Tomorrow might be drought. And all these things uh, actually make food scarcity a reality. And once food scarcity enters the equation, you can be rest assured that food security is at large. Uh, so right now, what is going on in Nigeria, a, a lot of locations have been flooded. A lot of people are fleeing their farmland. The immediate impact is not going to be felt yet until the water is, because there are several things to it. The immediate impact now, people are fleeing. We're, re, we're seeing on TV, that's one part. And then we're going to have a part whereby the flooding dies down and then all these other second and third other effect of it start coming out. Uh, how to rejuvenate those farmlands. You know, the government has to actually pour in a lot of support uh, for local farmers to get in there. We have a lot of belts in Nigeria. We have the tuba belt. We have the grain belts. All these things are currently being hampered. We're still kind of recovering from insecurity. The real challenge of terrorism, banditry, and uh, herdsmen that is still are uh, plaguing those zones. Uh, there's a lot of report I read about how some of this insecurity, and I wrote on it extensively, about how this uh, insecurity has really hampered a lot of production out of Nigeria. Nigeria is not producing as it used to. And now, now adding all these uh, environmental challenges on one point, and then, you know, these are natural disasters. Let's talk about it. There's man-made disaster and there's natural disaster. So let's talk about the natural disaster of, draw, of uh, drought and flooding first. That's one thing that you really can't control. Actually, depending on you talking to on climate change, you can't control it to a large extent. That's one part. And then we have the man-made disaster of insecurity. That's one. Now let's talk about the one we can control, which is infrastructure. 70% of foods in Nigeria, 70% of cost of food in Nigeria is attributed to logistics. So now let's look at it doing the permutation and combination kind of thing in mathematics. If 70% of food is attributed to logistics and the cost of logistics, let's look at the amount people are buying uh, fuel, the amount they're buying diesel, 
the amount the mechanics are charging for repair parts. Most of these repair parts actually come from outside the country. They have to do dollar exchange. Uh, you have to do clearing at the port. Just look at how now kind of put all those things together for you to actually repair a truck to get it on the road. That's one part. You know, if anything happens, the tires that is being, it's not locally produced, they're actually being shipped. So these idol, the issue of dollar exchange affects logistics. And then, in, of course, all these people are they going to spread this cost over hi, the media. Hi, Adebayo. Sorry. Can you hear me? Sure, I can. Okay, so I don't want us to, I mean, I, I feel like you are in the middle of it, so you have a lot um, to talk about. So let's not just continue talking about it and then lose people in the process. Because I sure. think one of the purpose of this conversation is for listeners to also um, see where they can come in and how they can begin to raise these conversations as we even get closer to the elections, right? Ask the right questions. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like that you said natural disasters and man-made. And even before mm -hmm. this flood thing came up, um, we've had the one you mentioned, like insecurity, because I know of an agri-tech that had to pull out their, um, their, their, their sources from a lot of um, farmlands in the north because of the unrest with the headsmen and all that. And that happened. The impact was on ground before we got here now. So if you have to really look at the state of the Nigeria food supply chain like we're talking about, where would you say we are and where can we begin to do the right thing? Because it is a disaster. We can go on and on. Um, I, I'm sure that in the next two to five years, we'll begin to see the real impact. I don't think we're seeing it yet. So how can we begin to do the right thing? And what exactly is the stage right now if you're going to put a percentage on it? But if I will put a percentage on it, uh, I would say it's about 20%. Uh, Nigeria is really below and below the bar. When it comes, if you're actually doing between, I mean, zero to 100, I think a 20% of it. Uh, there's a scarcity of food because it's several reasons we talk about the man-made. Let's, let's, let's not talk about the natural disaster. Let's talk about man-made that you actually alluded to. Uh, prior to all this flooding and whatnot, you have uh, insecurity that has been plaguing all, you know, different geopolitical zones in Nigeria. That's one part. And then we have infrastructural issue that is also plaguing Nigeria as well. I've always been of opinion that Nigerian roads are not built for prosperity. It's just not, it's just not built for prosperity. If you look at what has Nigerian exp exp has experienced in the past and what it's currently experiencing now, the roads are not making sense. I don't know who actually map out these roads because the areas that have abundance, hear me out here, the area that has abundance of food do not have road access to the area that has scarcity. It's an inventory issue, Nigeria. There are a lot of places that have abundance of food, but there is no way to get this food out to places that have scarcity. And that in itself says a lot about our infrastructural status of logistic infrastructure in Nigeria. So all these roads that we are constructing, where are they constructing it? Who is constructing it? Who is mapping these roads? There are some of these. So these are areas that we can make improvement to our logistical infrastructure. And then, if we can make this tweak in our logistical infrastructure, we can actually raise our ability to feed the nation. If we can actually have accessibility of roads from farmlands to where the market is, and I think we can have we can have a huge impact uh, I, on this good goal. I think that when you also talk about roads. Um, infrastructure wise, right? Um, or logistics wise, is the road the most effective way to transport this food and this produce? Is that best practice? Because I know we're highly reliant on roads here in Nigeria, but is it really best practice? Depends. Nigeria, the farthest point in Nigeria is about 1,200 kilometers, that agree to my degree or whatnot. So looking at the road network, it's probably the most ideal and the most cost-effective way to do it. Barring, and I repeat, barring good roads and secure and secure road network. Barring is probably the most, the cheapest and the most viable way. Because you have to also understand as well, because when you're moving from one location to the other in Nigeria using the road network, you're actually having different hubs along the way. So the, the road is the most viable and the, probably the most objective way to actually move stuff because you're stopping in different nodes and you're delivering goods as you go along from one destination to the other. So it's probably the best way. And the next best thing is uh, train. But we know we're lacking a lot in that uh, in the country. And of course, the last part is air. Uh, almost every big city in Nigeria has an airport right now, but it's probably quite expensive to move uh, certain type of food product, except for fresh food and vegetables, because of their freshability and preferability. Hmm. 
still on infrastructure, right? Um, logistics now, to be precise. I remember mm. when this administration, when they came in and a lot of real work were being done, um, one of the things that the Honorable Minister mentioned was um, this logistics for food and for a lot of things, right? So looking at where we were before um, 20... 15 right and where we are now do you think that the work that has been done in that sector um will do anything or do we have a lot more work to be done there's a lot more work to be done i believe a lot of road networks have been constructed uh these are i mean plus for this current administration i believe they've poured so much amount of work on the road network but there's one thing to have a road network there's one thing to have a, a road network that has a logistical corridor to it there's a completely different. Uh, when you have a road network that leads to the other, that farm, that there's, there's a certain roads they call farm to farm to market roads. I mean, just direct route from whatever farm settlement to the market. But when you have roads that are just connecting one city to the other, then what of what benefit is those roads to where the, you, you need them to be? That's one part. So that's what I said. You know, certain roads are being built, but they are not function. Their functionality on what they're supposed to do is quite off a bit. And also, let's talk about cold storage. Um, as you move foods along, especially for for perishability, if you you mentioned tomato earlier in the earlier in the, in, on the show, uh, you know you move. Kano is the, probably the Kano state is the, is the state that produces the most tomato in country, and of course they move. I mean, billions and billions worth of naira of tomato to Lagos. Um, on day to day basis, uh, there's a lot of, I think last time I checked, about 60% perishability rate because it takes about 72 hours to move stuff from Kano to uh, to Lagos, of course. And you know how they store this thing in basket. By the time they get here, it's all spoiled and whatnot. So imagine we have a cold storage facility along those routes uh, as you move from Kano to Kaduna to Abuja to the southern part. It can actually help a lot. Uh, and, and those are the areas that the government can actually improve in different settlements and different root networks of providing cold storage to be able to kind of expand the life uh, the life cycle of this uh, food product as we move them from one location to the other. Um, I think we'll take a short break now. Um, and when we come back, we'll pick up the conversation from right here. Please stay with us. So thank you for staying with us. If you're just tuning in, we're discussing the state of Nigeria's food supply chain with Adebayo Adelike. Remember, you can still join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818038 Tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 um, with the hashtag WayShow. So Chinua, you have a question for us? Yeah, okay. So um, I mean, we agree that there's been like a great, would I say, impact on food insecurity in Nigeria so far through, um, like you rightly said, or like you rightly said as well, in terms of infrastructure and storage and all of that. But then let's come to technology, right? How do you, Mr. Dibai, how do you think technology can be improved in order to help food insecurity or food security, as the case may be in Nigeria? I'm believer that technology is going to save us all. It's going to be the, uh, since we missed our industrialization, I believe the use of technology is going to help Africa and Nigeria, most especially, to leapfrog a lot of develop developmental processes. In the area of food security, in the area of tagging, because there's one part of food security that we talked about, which is making sure that we get food from one location to the other and we reduce the effect of density on the food value chain. There's another part as well, which is the health and safety of the food we are eating. Oftentimes we don't, you know, I mean, we're pretty much used to it. We, our markets are informal, our tomatoes and pepper are all over the street with flies and whatnot. We're used to that. We have that immune system. But there are certain things that we're immune against as well. I think we can use the use of technology to track where these particular products are coming from. In case there's an outbreak that is caused by food, we can actually use this technology of blockchain and whatnot to be able to trace exactly where these particular uh, food is coming from. Then when we can isolate the particular problem and treat it as necessary instead of causing panic across the nation. That's one part as well. In the area of logistics and supply chain, traceability, tracking, and especially in the use of uh, in the use of uh, the transportation uh, as well. We, I mean, technology is going to help us impact. But most especially, the use of technology in farming. 
you know, precision farming. I think a lot of farms in Nigeria are now adopting precision farming, ability to use data gathered over the course of time to be able to know exactly when to plant, where to plant, and the right of uh, necessary fertilizer that needs to be put on the on the ground, and you know, uh, so that you can have a better yield of the weather, whatever product is being produced. And these are how technology can help us kind of maximize what we already have going on. It can help us uh, kind of for 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 better. For well, how do I how do I put this? Uh, it can help us kind of mask our issues for now. The use of technology can help us mask our issues until we can able to we are able to actually <coughs> fix some of the problems. Okay, so I'd like to come back to um, when you talked about the distance and the road network from farms to um, the hubs where the food is needed. Right um, mm -hmm. today, I think one of the states, I, I think it's Benue State, that has the tag, the food basket of the nation. And then we know that a lot of our core vegetables, tomatoes, onions, all of those things also do come from the north. Um, is there a possibility that in being able to make the logistics, given that we've also said that the road is the most effective currently, um, is there a way to look at the farmland that we have right across the country? to limit or reduce the distance with which this food has to travel. We seem to be so dependent on a particular region for our food now. What are your thoughts there? Absolutely. And it makes sense because they are clusters. I mean, they, it, in, I mean it makes sense. Areas that are very good in this area, let them produce as much as they can so that these areas can actually focus on other things else. But at the same time, because of the issues we're having with security and uh, the issue of logistics and supply chain, it's hard to look at other alternatives, which is to let other areas explore other particular foods to be planted in their areas. If the Benue or what we call the belt, uh, the, the fruit basket of Nigeria, is not being able to satisfy the rest of the country because of security issues and issues of supply, logistics and whatnot. Yes, I think a viable option is to make sure that other areas that can produce might not be as optimal and must be as advanced, but at least you have some kind of diversification. So we don't have every reliance on this particular part of the country. Absolutely. I think that is a viable option and it should be always be part of a solution to be actually tabled. Okay, so I was also going to ask, um, I think there's one part we haven't touched on, which is um, pest and disease. I'm not sure how much this has affected agriculture in Nigeria, but I know this is a thing that can actually um, affect the food supply chain, right? So what do you think is happening in that aspect? So, you know, we've talked about this. I have my opinions about this. I don't know if it's founded or not, but uh, I know the reasons why a lot of these foods, uh, the GMOs, I know Nigerians don't like it. Uh, at least people that are aware of it don't like GMOs. Uh, but the reason why GMOs are quite attractive is because they are they guard against the way they did the genome combination is to guard against some of these pests and whatnot that are very predominant in areas like this. Uh, but. I don't think, you know, uh, th there are several ways to look at this. Yes, it is pests and all these uh, diseases are part of what's going to actually f reduce our food production. But at the same time, I think adoption of GMOs, uh, I don't want people to stone. Actually, I'm online, so nobody can stone me here. But uh, I think uh, I think uh, it's a way to actually kind of step, kind of sidestep the issue of pesticide. But if the government says, you know what, we do not want GMOs on our farmlands, then they should provide opportunities for farmers, subsidies for farmers, pesticides and whatnot, so that they can be able to produce so-called non-GMO foods. Because I don't see the way out, to be honest with you. I don't see the way out. The way our population is exploding is either we double up on the way we farm or we actually resort to GMO. There's no way around it. There's no way these particular farming methodologies can continue to sustain Nigerians if certain some of these things are not tweaked a bit to actually make accommodations to produce food for the country. So what, what would you say um, today, um, I think the, the question Elsie asked about where we are versus where we should be, um, I want to bring it home really to the government because if we look at the types of farmers that we have, compared to other countries, we don't see the huge sort of organized farming, um, big organizations into farming um, like we hear, have here in Nigeria. It's still very much localized farming, um, and a lot of farmers may not have the kind of funds or capital that they need to, in fact, go in the direction of GMO um, and things like that. So what kind of support in an ideal scenario would you expect to see to start to address some of these challenges we've talked about today? 
So I'm going to take it from a different angle that you guys probably haven't looked into, which is our agricultural. Because if you look at it, Nigeria has a system in place that works. If you look at our university system across Nigeria, there are a lot of agricultural school. I know there's one in Abeokuta. And I know there are some across the nation as well. The reason why these institutions are in place, and that's what the U.S. is actually using as well, if you look at the United States, the, the Midwest, which is called the breadbasket of the United States, most of those schools over there produce and whatnot, they're all farmlands and they're all farm schools. They basically, their main competencies are about agriculture. And I think Nigeria actually adopted that template as well. But unfortunately, along the line, something i don't know what happened but everybody is now doing whatever but those universities are put are actually in place to be able to address some of these issues about education and about farming about coming out with different methodologies to help the farmers uh in case we cannot toe the line of gmo yet but using those universities and those hubs to be that center and a focal point for them to be able to improve their farming practices because uh, we have the land and we have the expertise but we those areas those schools and those hubs those hubs created by the government should help those for local farmers, creating co-ops, creating cooperatives and whatnot that are existing and, and sharing knowledge, knowledge domain, the, the, the knowledge sharing of uh, different farm practices, what has been done, what is applicable, what is doable, depending on the geopolitical space and the type of soil is it. Those things are very, very, uh, they go a long way. They go a long way. And, and I believe that having those institutions in place and those farm hubs will help kind of propagate those kind of education. Uh, unfortunately, the agricultural university has turned to something else. They turned to something that they weren't supposed to be doing. So uh, I can attribute some of the challenges we have in our agricultural uh, sector today to some of how we have turned those institutions into non agri institutions. I like that you answered um, my next question by the way you f finalized it, because I was going to ask about the state of these institutions you mentioned. Um, I think the country we're trying to remember now is New Zealand and mm -hmm. how they do agriculture and people even going there to sort of see the new technology. So if you have these institutions, you should be expecting some exchange program mm -hmm. to be able to know what is really happening, what's the new technology, how is it working. But if you're just in your silos, um, fighting as to strike anyway, um, <laughs> studying maybe to. three months in a year, right? So how does that really work? Um, so I, I want us to talk solutions because I know we are getting to the end of this conversation. Um, I was looking up something um, a few days ago and I saw that yes, this, agri uh, this administration has talked about agriculture a lot, but people have also talked about the fact that the way they handled the distribution of these funds, um, some, in fact, I think some, at some point they were giving them cash in hand. You know, it wasn't well structured. You cannot um, necessarily trace the impact of that fund and see where to do better or how to really help them better. So how would you begin to advise that we do these things right? It's not just about earmarking a certain amount of money, because I know funding is a big deal, right? Even the government can't do it alone. A lot of private sectors have come in. But if you're going to do it and do it right, assuming we have that funding, how do we go about it? What's the best way? Do we have to collaborate with um, a body, the banks? How, what would be the best way to ensure that training is done and these equipment are deployed and, of course, we begin to maximize? Of course, food storage is also looked at. And everything is just sort of tied together to ensure that there is um, success in that area. Absolutely. Thank you for that wonderful question. I think there is a bundle. It's a bundle solution that needs to be done. Uh, on, the, on the equipment capital, that's one part. On the banking and financing, that's another part uh, that's needed. But from my standpoint, uh, and what I've observed as an outsider, what I've observed about Nigerian food supply chain, is the fact that now there are certain things on exportation as well, because there's a lot that the farmers can be gained. But the farmers, as I see them, don't even know the worth of their own effort. Uh, as I traveled to areas like in you know, the in the southwestern part of Nigeria, and I had several farmers, how do you come up with the price of your of your food, of your food product. They don't know. Hmm. They don't, and that's very sad. That's the, base, that's the baseline of everything. If farmers do not feel appreciated, if farmers do not understand how to actually attribute the cost of their labor to the, to, you know, to, like, look, these are more, these are much I'm selling it. You can't even, they can't even attribute the cost of their own labor, or they can't even put all those costs together, aggregate their cost that they use in farming. That is a major problem. I think the farmer's education and empowering the farmers is the number one thing that we can do for Nigeria. agriculture. <coughs> everything else is going to be a... It's going to be second and third order effect of it. When farmers start being empowered, when they start seeing the essence of the agricultural value chain, 
I think things are going to turn around over here. When you go over there, I say, you know, the price of the corn is 50 naira, and that is it. And across the board, they are either from their co-op or their co cooperative. There's a, so look, <laughs> before a, a product comes from a farmer to a market, oftentimes it changes, it touches about 20 hands, non-value hands touches those, those products. Uh, if somebody buy it, somebody, another person bought it, another person bought it, another person bought it. By the time you realize it, uh, 200 naira on top of nothing. And what have they done to improve the value of the product? Absolutely nothing. Mm. So I need it to empower the farmers and make sure that they understand the value chain of their product. And also removing those non-value hands in the supply chain of the product. We actually we serve two things. We empower the farmer. We make sure that people that are actually the consumers are well pleased, and also they are not, you know, breaking their bank to, uh, to to feed their family, and also create an enabling environment for all other parts of the uh, food supply chain. If we can actually do that, and and these things are within our reach, we don't even need government interventions for it. The state, I mean, we do need at some point uh, to a large extent. The state can actually help in educating the farmer. That's number one thing: educating the farmers. We can't do that enough. Most of the people that are touching up, well, they are not where people are actually getting fed. It's not the big farms; it's the small farms. The small, smaller farms are the ones feeding Nigeria, not the big ones. Yeah. So um, we're fast coming to the end of the show. Um, I'd like to take one final question because I know that your area of expertise is not just Nigeria, but Africa um, as a whole when it comes to supply chain. Um, whether you fall in the camp of people that think that Nigeria can never be well, or you fall in the camp of people that think that Nigeria is awesome, the current administration has spoken over time a lot about the fact that agriculture has been their focus and they've indeed done well, whether you agree or disagree. Um, I'd just like you to wrap up with us to tell us where do we fit in? So when we, if we were to rank countries in Africa today with this whole supply chain and moving food around where would nigeria fall with our 20 percent <laughs> yeah actually when you look at the logistical performance index of all african countries nigeria is not even ranked oh so, wow exactly well. because like, our infrastructure does not support it if you look at the yes nigeria is not even ranked so we have egypt we have south africa they have more matured uh, supply chain uh, infrastructure so for us to really be taken serious, our supply chain has to be done. We have to talk, I mean, we talk about supply chain training, talk about, there's a lot, there's a whole lot of games that, that goes into it. But uh, we are not where we used to be, and we are not where we need to be. Yeah. Uh, it's just a work in progress uh, as Nigerians. And I think continuously having conversations like this, discourse on issues that are really kind of, uh, uh, you know, where, where they have people have different pain points, uh, it's how we move, uh, as how we move the, the needle. And I think that the, the previous, I mean, the current administration has done a lot in kind of diversification. It's not, I mean, it's far from uh, the, the best, but at least it's better than what we used to. So we can only expect the next administration to pick it up from here and continue to improve on it. But um, as long as we continue to move, uh, as long as we continue to make movement, we're going to yeah. get there. But the <coughs> movement at home uh, will actually... Uh, be a no-no. So well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, you guys have been awesome, really nice. So thank you. We certainly enjoyed having you on the show, and um, we've learned a lot. You've shown. I think this last question you just answered is the definition of drops mic. Um, but it's been great to have you on the show. I think we have a few comments, ladies. Yeah. So this says, greetings, ladies. How much has Nimet helped in predictions for rains to enable farmers plan their food production? So many farmers lost due to irregular and abrupt stoppage of rains, leading to so much loss. That's from Benson. Thank, Thank you, you, Benson. Um, I have this one from, of course, Daniel <coughs> Ojo, our regular fan. He says, good evening, my dear beautiful sisters of ways. The character of a, um, oh, I think this might be an old one. Let me see. <coughs> um, yeah, I think this might be an old message, actually. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Do we have one? OK. okay. This is the last question, um, response. Mm. It's just to say we're not where we used to be. We're not where we, we want to be, we want but to we know we still have a long way to go. <laughs> and for a food-loving nation, hmm. for the Jollof Gang, 
Hmm. There's a lot to be said and a lot to be done there, but it has been an awesome conversation. Thank yeah. you so, so much, um, Elsie. Thank you, Chinolo, and thank you again to our guest, um, Adibayo. Before we go, um, do ensure to follow us on Instagram at Wayshow Africa. You can interact with us further, drop a comment, and most importantly, follow all our social media engagements. And remember to like, share, comment, and invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. So if you missed today's quote, here it is again. Civilization as it is known today could not have evolved nor can it survive without an adequate food supply. Um, so we'll see you again on Monday at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Have a great weekend. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you.